We have a, a panel discussion really focusing on complication avoidance and management. Uh, I'm Zach Litvak. I direct skull base and minimally invasive neurosurgery at Swedish Neuroscience Institute in Seattle. Um, we have a little bit of an audience poll that we'll start with. I'm going to go over some of the existing literature on complications with minimally invasive port surgery. And then we're going to take a run through uh, our collective greatest hits of uh, disasters since the last SSG three years ago. Uh, not to revel in it, but hopefully so that others can learn from our mistakes, we can learn from our own mistakes and do better for our patients. The next slide, please. So when we first, uh, before we start, I wanna go through and, and introduce uh, the panelists. I actually would like them to introduce themselves uh, and note any disclosures that they have. I, I don't have any, I'm looking for some, if any of you have some for me. Uh, Dr. Bales. Uh, yes, Julian Bales at uh, North Shore University Health System and uh, University of Chicago, Pritzker School of Medicine. Excellent. You guys almost sat in order. Gustavo. Yeah, just, just so we people associate a face with a name on the screen because oh, you're next on the okay. screen. Yeah. Is this on? It is on. Okay. Hi, uh, Gustavo Priam from Emory University and I do have my main one, which is the Enrich trial funded by Nico. I have no conflicts. BTW. Hi, Justin Singer, uh, Spectrum Health, Grand Rapids, Michigan, um, a site PI for the Enrich clinical trial, and then um, some educational Thanks. talks for SSG and Nico. All right. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Young. Uh, Ron Young at Delray Medical Center. I don't have any disclosures. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. So, uh, we're, like I said, we're going to start out with a poll. Please, uh, I know most of you have your phones out anyways, because we all have them surgically implanted in our hand. Go ahead and text SSG 2022 365 to the phone number 22333. That will register you and your phone with our polling system so that we can start answering the questions. And this is just three simple questions. We're not gonna to do too much, but wanted to sort of get a flavor and, and see where everybody in the room is in their evolution. So go ahead and uh, take your phone out, text SSG 2022-365 to 22333, and go ahead and get started with the poll. All right. Uh, so let's uh, let's switch over to the poll, please, Heather, before we get to this. Yep, that's fine. Gives everybody who's wandered in in the last few minutes a moment to register with the polling system. Great, okay. So for those of you in the audience uh, who are surgeons, please answer by texting either A or B to that same number you just registered with. Have you experienced a complication of any kind due to any cause while performing a brain path or MIPS case? So this is inclusive of, of using things other than a brain path re retractor, but doing a MIPS approach. And as you can see, we're starting to get some feedback in the lower right. We've got 16 and counting responses. Give that another moment. See if we, uh, looks like we're leveling off pretty, pretty closely here. And Dr. Litvak, if you want a grand reveal, we can do that. Or on the next one, we can, as they come in, watch the results. You just let me know. Okay. So for, uh, for this one, let's just reveal the results at this point. Okay, so about two thirds of the people who've done these types of cases have experienced some sort of complication, not surprising. Okay, so next question, and we'll see the results on this next question as people start responding. What 
type of response or what type of complication did you experience? And I've categorized these in how I think of them. So one is a targeting or localization error. Basically, you missed or you weren't quite where you thought you were going to be. Uh, next one related to targeting or tools is an incomplete resection that changed your post-op management, including potentially taking the patient back. Um, and I think you can even respond more than once on this one if you've had more than one type of complication. Post-op hemorrhages that have changed uh, the management um, and new uh, neurologic deficits. Um, and then uh, the occasional conversion to a craniotomy or aborting uh, the procedure. It doesn't look like it's letting us do more than one response, but so far it seems like the majority or most common complication is an incomplete resection. We'll talk about that uh, with some of our case discussions. Uh, so th this also doesn't surprise me. Um, Conversions to open craniotomies, we'll, we'll talk about that too. We're going to talk about all of these. So next slide, uh, and this is our last polling question. And this is just your opinion of the root cause, okay? Was, the, was it a, a navigation error, some sort of targeting error? Was it their inadequate visualization, either because of the port that was chosen or the visual tools that you had? Um, was it due to inadequate instrumentation, either you and your center don't have certain instrumentation or you feel like the instrumentation just doesn't exist. Um, and then lastly, the dreaded and famous technical error in execution, uh, which is a nice way of saying you yourself could have done better. So I think, you know, this is revealing to me that we still feel like despite using endoscopic um, assisted approaches using exoscopes, the newer generation microscopes, we still feel like we're getting inadequate visualization with the tools that we have. All right, so I'm gonna move on uh, back to our slides so we can uh, do just a quick overview. So uh, Kai, who is here this morning, um, but had to step out this afternoon uh, in 2020, uh, published a nice uh, systematic review with meta-analysis uh, for deep-seated brain lesions um, using tubular retractor systems. So this was an all-comers in terms of the type of retractors that was used. The majority of the cases were tumors. There were a few vascular lesions, primarily cavernomas. There were a few colloid cysts included in this. About 30% of uh, the patients that were included uh, utilized a brain path, about 11% used the Vicor system, uh, about 20% used a metrics or a modified metric system from the spine, and then up to 40% used some sort of modified custom retractor system uh, that, that was built in-house essentially. Interestingly, across uh, all of these different systems, the overall uh, incidence of complications was about 9%. And this is pretty consistent with some of the data that we'll see coming out. Um, there was no difference in the extent of, uh, extent of resection by the retractor system that was used. Uh, gross total resection was more likely with metastatic lesions than with primary brain lesions. Again, not surprising regardless of the type of surgery you're doing. Uh, and no difference in the, in the complications by the retractor system used. Now, I think that to me, I would interpret this two ways, and I'd love to hear what our panelists have to say. One is that um, the extent of resection has to do not with the retractor system that's used, but it's intrinsic to the type of tumor and some of the limitations that we consistently run into in differenti differentiating that transition zone at the margin of an infiltrating glioma to normal tissue and or People were stopping intentionally uh, because they did, were doing mapping or anatomically knew they were near a critical structure. The other thing that I think this does is validate minimally invasive parafasicular surgery as an approach in and of itself, regardless of the hardware that you're using uh, in terms of the complication rate. 
And I'll just go down the panel, starting with Ron. Any thoughts on these results? I think one thing that influences the extent of resection, especially early on with cases, is the experience with tubular retractor systems and how to take a systematic approach to getting that resection when you're working from the inside out. So I think those with a lot of experience you know, have a greater extent of resection in general, but early on, sometimes surgeons are leaving some tumor behind. Yeah. Gustavo? Yeah, I think learning curve is, is a big part of that. Um, the other thing that all of these meta-analysis are going to have is, of course, there's so much under-reporting of complications that we maybe can double this. Now, that summary just says overall, uh, I think in that study, they were split in between major and minor, and uh, there are things inherent to uh, this approach, but there are others that were common. And I think in terms of major complications, hemorrhage was the biggest one that we all feared was a post-operative hemorrhage because um, you were doing a vascular lesion and, and you just rebled, or because you did a subtotal resection on a vascular tumor and then you have a wounded glioma syndrome and it bleeds post-operatively. I think those are, in my mind, on terms of complications, the two that I really, fear the most. Yeah, Justin? Yeah, um, you know, uh, fresh off of my vascular lesions talk, you know, I, certainly rebleeding, I think, um, uh, ends up being my worst complication um, in two notable cases. Uh, and I think is, is just a challenge that I think many times, or at least many of the things that I would reflect on, certainly some technical errors in some of these cases, but um, visualization, which is definitely a portion of the learning curve for how you overcome uh, looking around the corner or seeing things that are kind of right. Uh, it's easy to look beyond the tube. It's very hard to see like what's on, uh, on the periphery of the tube. Uh, and at that point, actually, I remember maybe a couple of years ago, maybe, uh, last meeting in person, Julian said, you know, you can take out the tube, by the way, um, and then look right where the tube would be and make sure your, your margins are clean in those areas. And I've actually kind of routinely started to do that uh, and have seen improvements in my post-op MRIs, especially for tumors. So, you know, this is... Um, uh, you know, as a multimodal treatment, um, you know, you're not married to one set once you get there. If you've accomplished most of your strategy in one way, I need to alter it so you can be more successful at the end. I think being adaptive in that way and looking at your results um, to try and improve is very important. And Julie? Uh, yeah, great points. I, to, to me, I'm not surprised. Visualization is number one because for me, that's been uh, the biggest challenge. So uh, especially for deep, large lesions that are heterogeneous and enhancing and partially necrotic and a lot of edema. You know, I always try to dock at the, at the most medial distal part of the lesion and then back out. And to me, it's a little bit like uh, sometimes when you take a vertebral body uh, metastatic or other tumor out, you're work, you feel like you're working in a barrel and you don't know necessarily what's back here. And the surgeons, we tend to, or at least I do, tend to follow our line of sight and everything's very easy when you can look and see something, but sometimes you forget what's behind here. So my technique, uh, Arjan, one of our residents is back there. He can tell you that my technique is for these deep, large lesions is to do just what Justin says, to dock at the, at the deepest portion and then begin to back out, let the tumor deliver itself within the port. And then don't be too proud at the very end to take the shepherd's hook off the retractor system and put a thick steel retractor in there and that can really help you clean up the edges so i think it's uh, uh we we want to have success and and win at the case and i think you can as you said we combine uh, all the tools that we have and that's where i would do it in fact i have a, a case i was we have time i'll show it to, for that regard great um, so the group down in uh, Florida also um, produced a similar systematic review. Uh, they identified 44 articles for in inclusion with 426 patients, um, really just including brain path, vicor, and metrics. They, they excluded the custom retractor group, um, about two-thirds tumor, less than a third were vascular. Um, their overall complication rate in this group was 7.7%, uh, so still close to and within the range of that 9% we just saw. Overall mortality uh, of 3.8%, and no significant difference. You can see the p-values down below in uh, complications or mortalities based on the type of retractor system that was used. So again, we're 
really getting down to some intrinsic um, complications, morbidity and mortality associated with the approach and the type of lesions that we're working on and the location that we're working because these tend to be near the deep gray structures. Um, that same group uh, then did a subgroup analysis looking just at the brain path tubular retractors, uh, pretty similar distribution in tumor versus vascular uh, cases, overall complication rate of 8.3%. Uh, interestingly, within this uh, series uh, uh, that were studied, there were no uh, targeting failures for biopsy. So tissue was always obtained within the bio biopsy subset. Um, there was a, about a 20% incomplete tumor resection, which is similar to what we just pulled in the room. Uh, Rebleed was shown to be about 2.4%. Uh, I wonder, to Gustavo's point, if that's a little underreported uh, in the series. Uh, and overall complications in the vascular group uh, was about 2.4%. So when we think about how to approach minimizing complications, uh, like I said, within the poll, I like to think about this in really five categories, right? You can get targeting or localization errors. Uh, you can get incomplete resections, you get hemorrhage, you get new deficits, uh, and then you have conversions. And I think for all of these, there are different uh, rubrics, different frameworks for how to approach it. Uh, so for localization errors, um, you know, the two things that I think of, and we'll, we'll go down the line here to see what other people have to say. One is if I think it's going to be a firm or inelastic lesion doing a shallow dock on the surface of the lesion, as opposed to trying to get to that deep medial portion of it. The idea there is for the more firm lesions, especially some of the smaller ones that are about 1.5 centimeters or less, there's a chance that it actually rolls off the side of the trocar as you're inserting and ends up next to the port as opposed to in the field of the port. Intraoperative ultrasound uh, is a great option. As we heard this morning uh, from the King's group, if you don't have a dedicated probe, making a slightly larger craniotomy so that you can do ultrasound parallel to the port, or if you're fortunate enough, uh, there are industry partners that have created probes that go down. Um, but I, I think that ultrasound is something that isn't utilized enough in one form or another. Ron, any comments on targeting or localization errors? I think the two key strategies I use for, especially a small firm lesion, one ultrasound, very helpful uh, when targeting these lesions. And I will also, rather than targeting direct to the surface, I actually pick a point off to the side just a little bit so I know which way the lesion is going to roll when it rolls. And that way I can pre-plan pulling back my port a little bit and looking that direction. But there's there's nothing better than ultrasound in that instance. Yeah. Gustavo? I think one of the differences when you walk out this room from our previous meetings is how much the uh, instrumentation has evolved. I saw, I think, four different new sets of bipolars that are so much better. And that really makes a big difference um, when you have the right instrumentation, especially bipolars that not only coagulate, but dissect really well. And if you have a, a keyhole set of dissectors on these firm lesions, for example, it helps tremendously. Uh, and then the other part of this, and we were just talking about this, is adding to your visualization uh, either a micro-inspection tool, which uh, you know, the size microscope has one, or using a keyhole or a ventriculoscope even with a 30 or a 45 degree angulation at the end of your work can really give you that last panoramic view uh, without having to angle the port more than 30 degrees and, and put extra force on it. Yeah, so you know, one comment uh, in regards to both the instrumentation and the visualization in my OR, my pick list for brain path procedures includes all of my endoscopic and the nasal equipment. So I have a scope and a tower for that, for inspection purposes, ready to go. I've got my curettes and all of my long endonasal instruments ready to go. Uh, and, and I find that invaluable when it comes to working on some of those lesions. Justin? 
thoughts? Yeah, I think um, we job with Old Shonda, I think, well, very often, um, although have uh, particularly in a pinch, which is not the best time to use it. So I think the strategy of using it more often, and part of it is also, you know, what we have available. I do not have a, um, we don't have a, we have a burr hole um, probe. We don't have a probe that will fit down. And there is a limitation there, although it will work. Um, I think the visualization part, I, I think, is something, especially for tumors that we were just kind of chatting with up here. Um, I, I don't know if anyone else does this when they're operating through the brain path, when they're kind of like leaning to the side to get around the corner, um, but you can't see around the corner. Um, it's, uh, it's very challenging. Um, and I think the first time I ever thought about it or saw it was when Gabriel Zada, um, uh, I think it was an intraventricular uh, cavernous malformation case he posted on Twitter or YouTube. And I watched it like, how come I never thought of that? Um, cause we have a Kivo. Um, so I've started to use that more often for cases, um, for inspecting afterwards. And I think that's been great. And it's an, a great adjunct to help look around those corners, um, at the end, um, to make sure that, that, um, things where you want them to be. And then the instruments, um, I, are, we have finally have like tools. I think that we're in a good spot and I feel happy that I could do pretty much all the cases, but everything that we have now is only because there was a deficiency in a prior state to get us there. Uh, I do think that's where working with um, our reps and, and your partners, um, who are helping you cover these cases is actually uh, a way that you can be very successful because they know what other centers are using and what other tools have been really um, successful. Um, and it's a great um, knowledge sharing uh, experience to make sure that you're not, you know, shorthanded when you need something kind of unique. Yeah, great comments. Um, you know, my previous comments notwithstanding, I, I really was talking about soft uh, GBMs and other things, but you're right, shallow docking is very helpful, particularly for firm, uh, often metastatic lesions and, and not having to undergo the, the rolling phenomenon. The other thing that, you know, through the years I've noticed is that one of the toughest things is a big, deep tumor with a lot of edema. If you use steel retractors, you've got to creep in there and, and there's tissue creep around the, the retractor and it's it's hard getting that surgical corridor. There's nothing better than our navigated brain path. You're right at the you dock it right at the part of the lesion you want to be at. And then if it, once it stays in a little while, not long, 20, 30, 60 minutes, and you take it out, you have a ready-made parafascicular, nicely dissected cavity that you can use to resect. So I, I use that. Uh, I use it often in a way to create my surgical corridor to complete the last part of the resection. Yeah, so moving on to the next, you know, thing to tackle and, and trying to minimize the in outcome of an incomplete resection. We talked a little bit about our tools. We heard a little bit earlier today about fluorescence agents, you know, depending on what your team is used to using uh, commonly, that may be ALA. There's a huge camp that's in favor of fluorescein uh, for isolating uh, glioma. I don't like it because it's a blood pool agent. It's not a tissue selective agent. Uh, and so as the procedure goes on, you start getting bleeding into the field and you really can't uh, determine what's what. And then you also, when you're dissecting the margin of the tumor and you start beating the tissue up, you've disrupted that blood brain barrier. And so tissue that wasn't fluorescing initially in the case will start fluorescing yellow later in the case. Um, but I think, you know, there are some instrument uh, limitations in terms of delivering fluorescence uh, down the tube. We're starting to see some development from our industry partners in this space. I think that's going to be very exciting. Again, intraoperative ultrasound. Uh, I would encourage you, like Stealth, use it on every case, even if you're not going to really rely on it, just so you get used to seeing what tumor, what hematoma, what contused brain looks like during the case so that when you really need it, you're used to making that differentiation. Uh, and certainly if you have uh, an intraoperative MRI, uh, that's another option. Uh, and one of the nice things about a lot of the, the ports that are available commercially is that they are MR compatible. You can leave your port in position while you do your scan. Um, Julian, any other thoughts on minimizing the outcome of an incomplete reception? Well, no, I agree with what you said. The uh, I, I think for the ultrasound, the key is to use it before you uh, start the section, so you get an idea of the echogenicity of it and the shape of it. Uh, to me, it's hard to interpret it uh, after you've done most of the resection. So getting that baseline and what people have emphasized today, you have to really use it as many cases as you can to get the feel for it. 
uh, we have used fluorescence as well. I, I, I like it and uh, always amazed how when you think with white light, you've done a great job, there's still some enhancement left and it can help uh, clean up the edges in, in many cases. All right, I want to jump to the uh, control of post-op hemorrhage or minimizing the risk of post-op hemorrhage because I think we're going to spend some time talking about this and see a few cases. I think for me, the, the one thing that's really different uh, in terms of how you approach your procedure is, I am not one of these surgeons, but there are a lot of surgeons that I know will basically do the procedure and worry about cleaning up and getting hemostasis at the end. And that's great if you've got an open field and you've got access to everything. But if you're working through a port, it's very unlikely that you're gonna be able to get back and expose what was there bleeding. And so you really need to do stepwise hemostasis as you go. And so one of the things that I emphasize with my fellows is you see a vessel, you get definitive control of it then and there. You don't wait later on. You don't and you do it with bipolar and scissors, you don't tear it with the suction and then try to chase it because it's going to retract into the edematous tissue. Uh, and you get a dry field before you move your port to look in another area. Um, and I couldn't agree with what Justin said more about just not you know, stuffing a bunch of flow seal or surgicel or something down there and hoping for the best. Other thoughts, I know we've got a lot of experience with hemorrhages that came out the wrong way, but a lot of experience with hemorrhages up here. You know, one thing I've found that is key is having a way to irrigate, you know, at a distance down the port. So what I do is just take a sucker, put it on the end of a 20 cc syringe, little bone wax over it. And now I have an angled irrigator that I can use down the port and find those small bleeding vessels rather than just putting in a lot of patties and then chasing it. And I found that to be very helpful. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point. And that reminded me of another trick that I like, which is when I'm working intraventricularly, I know I'm going to leave an EVD at the end of the case. So at the very beginning, when I first cannulate, I pass an EVD next to the port, right along the, the side of the port, and I leave it there the entire time. So it's not blocking my view but I have another catheter that I can irrigate distal to the port during the case and flush the ventricle out. Gustavo, any thoughts? One of the, one of the things that we, we deal with is patients that are on anticoagulants and that are not sufficiently reversed despite you following the prescribed dosing for that. And uh, you know, the two things that we do for that, one is the hypertensive challenge uh, that we do at the end, about 20 points above their map and just wait for five minutes. And the other thing that we do is if it's persistently oozing, we've used tranexamic acid. And that's really helped when nothing is working uh, to, to slow it down enough to be able to decannulate and, and close. So those are my awesome justice thoughts. Yeah, um, I do. I think it this varies a little bit based on the pathology. The areas where I think I've had um, the most significant new bleeds uh, relate to like ICH cases I've done, and they were in um, some of my earlier cases. One of the things that um, I think was kind of surprising to me when I first started doing these cases is you know bloody CSF and uh, and actually active bleeding can be challenging to distinguish between, um, and um, sometimes. Um, it will be easy to trivialize when you're in the ventricle being like, oh, this is just CSF that's bloody welling up into your field. Uh, and that's where irrigation and being just really, really patient, which is challenging for most of us, um, is most advantageous. Um, and actually, I've never uh, done the uh, hypertensive um, uh, challenge afterwards, but I love that idea. Um, I do think post-operative care for these patients won't obviate any complication, but particularly for patients with hypertensive hemorrhages, really strict blood pressure control, being on the same page with your anesthesiologists um, rather than doing a wake up exam and your patient, you know, hacking on the tube and coughing and their blood pressure stocks being up to 200, things like that are challenging when you're already closed. But uh, really don't assume it's going to be, uh, it's going to be good if it looks pretty good. Um, keep on irrigating, be certain that you're closing and it's good. No, none of us close the craniotomy uh, wanting, uh, you know, uh, seeing active bleeding. Um, so uh, don't make any assumptions. Just take the time, be very, very diligent. And I do agree with Zach's point about um, if you see something active in your field, 
uh, particularly at the depths of a hemorrhage, the cavity is going to collapse around you. Um, unlike the scuba technique, um, you will not be able to you know, reobtain that access without traversing possibly uninjured brain. Uh, and it's going to be very challenging to get back there uh, and stop it. So you have to be very active early on. The sequence for me would be uh, to certainly achieve hemostasis completely at the depth before you begin to withdraw your port because you don't want to go back there. You may not be able to really get access. Uh, I don't like to, uh, I, I haven't used the hypertensive challenge. I don't want to put those thoughts in our anesthesiologist's <laughs> head. So Valsalva maneuvers will do a few times. Uh, I like uh, surgery flow with gel foam and then uh, uh, cotton balls with peroxide half diluted because I think they circumferentially exert some pressure, not for any active bleeding, but for the little nuisance oozing you may get. And um, uh, I think that's the main thing. If you do all of those, you really should not get a post-operative hemorrhage. All right. Uh, for neurologic deficits, I mean, we've been talking about this all day, right? This is really your trinity of DTI and understanding fascicular anatomy, intraoperative neuromonitoring, whether that be subcortical stimulation or a weak craniotomy, which I think in the three years since we last met, there's been a huge leap in the number of people routinely performing awake MIPS procedures. Uh, I remember when the first case was presented up here of an awake craniotomy and everybody kind of gasped, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, and then just surgical planning, right? And, and accepting the fact that you may not be able to address the entire lesion, especially if you're talking about something like a thalamic tumor or something in the corticospinal tracts. Um, and, you know, conversions and abortions of procedures uh, really comes down, I think, to case planning and case selection. Um, and with that in mind, um, we're gonna have some case discussions, starting with Dr. Bales. Um, I just had to throw in this timely comic from the New Yorker. Um, so uh, Dr. Bale is going to talk to us a little bit about that, that issue of not being able to complete the case that you thought you would. So th thanks, Zach. So I'm going to go through these uh, slides really quickly. So this is a recent case, 28-year-old female presented with a hemianopsia and headaches. And so this is sort of the classic case I was just describing, deep heterogeneous and I was trying at her age to preserve her optic radiations. The DTI showed that the medial paramedian pathway was safe as they were deflected laterally. So what uh, happened in this case was that uh, the, the, uh, th through the brain path, there was too much edema. There was too much uh, creep even into the end of the port. And uh, that's what I was alluding to when I talked about, you know, it's, you combine trying not to go lateral at all with a paramedian approach. Uh, now, this lesion, unfortunately, goes into the splenium, and uh, there was no attempt to, to resect that. Uh, but this is sort of what that begins to look like. So, uh, again, I've expressed my thoughts about uh, using it initially to create a very safe, navigated parafascicular approach and then having the flexibility to change to still fix retractors if you need to. Uh, this uh, montage here kind of shows a few other issues. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the small incision, the middle upper panel shows the concept of uh, bone collision. And so that's been mentioned earlier today. That's something else that can uh, limit or cause you to abort or cause you to have to extend your training. Uh, you see the ultrasound being used. You see a small dural opening. And you also see on the bottom right the port beginning to, to back out. And so uh, if, you, if you're if you using the NICO system, I suggest you, you grab the, the uh, shepherd's hook mid-portion. It has a much better uh, mechanical advantage because you cut your lever arm and that system in half, and it tends to lessen that. But that's, again, uh, the source of frustration and some difficulty with visualization. And then, of course, I want to show a picture of me operating. Uh, no, uh, upper left, again, you see the nice use of a paramedian approach for the cortical spinal tract. And comfort, after, after already having one neck surgery myself, 
I think it's uh, it's always good to emphasize that uh, you got to maintain p- comfort and a straight on approach, so you don't have complications on yourself. The bottom left is the ultrasound showing the tumor, and of course, we haven't talked much today about, and this is in surgical planning, of course, but there's structure with MRI, there's anatomy, there's fiber traction, there's functional areas, so all this is important in complication avoidance and picking the right uh, pathway, so you won't be disappointed. You see the arcuate there, and you see the green uh, cortical spinal tract coming down. And as you see on the right-hand panel, we we do know, and there are many cases of fiber tract recovery. So encourage you to uh, be optimistic and stay with your plan as long as it's working because fiber tract recovery is possible. Uh, knowing beforehand, this is surgical theater, but uh, knowing uh, beforehand where the vasculature is certainly can help you is any intraaxial lesion. Uh, here's real-time uh, MRI uh, ultrasound, and we will overlap that, overlay that with MRI. Uh, and also, as been as been mentioned before, you can use ultrasound as you see in this ICH before you do your final closure uh, that there's no postoperative hematoma. Uh, this is the uh, transport uh, uh, ultrasound which we have. And you can imagine the, uh, the benefits of that. Here's, here's pictures here. You see the port coming down at 12 o'clock and you see the lesion. And here's a high mag view there, nicely demonstrated. So uh, this really uh, helps uh, in, in cases in having uh, kind of a poor man's intraoperative imaging technique. So all these things we're talking about for complication avoidance really is... Uh, uh, using multimodality uh, and, and adaptation, isn't it? And that's what's, that's what's the key for all of us. It's a little bit different, but it's these technologies. And, and as was said earlier, this, this meeting has seen an evolution in the technology. These are the technical issues and problems for me. And I think maybe we've already mentioned about all of them. Uh, it's good to know that as far as we can tell, there is no significant ischemia. Uh, with a brain path port. Uh, we used to see that a fair amount with fixed retractors, uh, whether, you, uh, uh, whether you choose to do sub, subcortical monopolar mapping, you can. Uh, there you see, uh, in this case, a yellow 560 die on the bottom right. And uh, I s- certainly, for the most part, use the microscope versus the exoscope, but uh, we, we use both. Thanks. Okay. So uh, this is a good example of what uh, Gustavo was talking about with the wounded glioma syndrome. So this uh, is a 63-year-old male who presents with a hemi neglect and headaches. Um, and uh, I opted for a, a similar approach to what Julian just showed in terms of a paramedian posterior approach for this lesion. Um, before I even start, uh, panelists, would everybody do this via a MIPS approach or would people choose something else? Oops. Oops. Okay. Um, so case went well. Um, on the left is the pre-op scan. On the right is the immediate post-op scan. Little more hemorrhagic material than I would have liked to have seen at post-op day zero, um, but I would bring your attention to the calcifications of the choroid, which on the pre-op scan are midline, uh, and now you can see they've shifted back over, even though the frontal horns haven't shifted. We've clearly evacuated a significant amount of mass effect. So when I saw the scan, uh, I wasn't happy with the hemorrhage, but I was I was less concerned given the relief of the mass effect and the fact that at that point, patient clinically was doing really well. So wide awake, talking, no new deficits compared to pre-op. Uh, so that was at about one in the afternoon. Uh, and then Overnight, uh, about 1 a.m., uh, he gets his uh, post-op scan because all our inpatient scans are done after they're done doing outpatient scans for the day. Um, pretty happy with uh, the extent of resection. Uh, still a significant amount of edema in the surrounding brain. Uh, and at this point, it's 1 in the morning, and the nurse is saying, well, he's kind of a little funny. He seems a little sleepy, but it's 1 in the morning. So uh, didn't think too much of it. Um, unfortunately, uh, now post-op day one, so I put the immediate post-op scan on the left, 
You've got the repeat at 6 a.m. when he's now significantly uh, less alert, more somnolent. You can see there's more uh, acute and hyperacute blood product in there. We're starting to see uh, more extensive hypodensity outlining the head of the caudate and some of the other deep structures. And um, the calcification of that posterior choroid is starting to shift back over. So at this point, we make a decision and take him back for a decompressive crany and evacuation. And this is now go big or go home. This is not trying to recannulate. So this is a decompressive uh, crany shown on the left. Uh, and then the posterior fossa immediately post. Um, but he continued to decline throughout the day. And 12 hours later is his scan on the right. You can see at this point, we've lost our gray white. We have a cerebellar reversal sign. We've obliterated our fourth and our basal cisterns. And at this point, he's essentially meeting brain death criteria. Uh, we just haven't warmed him up enough uh, to get there. But unfortunately, we had to withdraw uh, and, and the family chose to withdraw the next morning. Um, so as I think about this, aside from just saying, oh, it's a wounded glioma, you know, it's always, what could I have done differently? And I think the main thing that I learned from this case is, you know, we're taught, don't use mannitol, don't hyperventilate, maintain ICPs. I think on the larger tumors with lots of edema, when I'm done with my resection, I'm going to give a full dose of mannitol because without bone being taken off, there's no give uh, in the space and Monroe Kelly comes to haunt you. Any thoughts from the, the group on this case? I think one, one of the things that I would ask you is, is what was your feeling when you finished the resection? Do you have a, a relaxed, very decompressed brain or was it tight? Um, it was tight, but not herniating out at me, right? And similarly, the hemostasis, you know, there are cases where you walk out of the OR and you've just got that dread and you're like, I'm not going to sleep tonight. I felt great after this case. I had a very false sense of security with this case. Yeah. That's the only thing that I do with what you just said. And I expect that when you do a resection that we're going to have that collapsed cough of cortex where the cannulation happened from the sulcus and that there's going to be a very relaxed brain with five millimeters or more of sagging into it, especially if you're around the ventricle. And if I don't see that, I worry, like, like you said, and I do do either hypertonic saline, high dose steroids and, and watch them closely for that. Annalise? Just wanna thank you for being so candid. I, I think we all have cases like this. Um, so I wanna say that because a lot of neurosurgeons don't show these cases. Um, so thank you for that. And then um, secondly, I was gonna just say that, um, and I think, you know, they just touched upon it. Sometimes I, I am a big 3% believer. So sometimes when I feel like, if you can tell, sometimes you can't tell interoperatively, but if you feel like there's just a lot of edema, I was curious if this patient, for example, was hyponatremic. I've had a patient who I took out a large tumor and they seem fine, but their sodium dropped overnight significantly. And then I think that may have, you know, just worsened their malignant edema. I don't know. If yeah, no, that's a good point. You know, his sodium was in the basically hovered in the 138 to 142 range. Obviously, when we made the decision to take him back for decompression, we started hypertonics. We actually gave a bullet at 23.4%, um, but that's another option in addition to mannitol to buy you some room and maybe prevent this, you know, and, and it's unclear to me still how much of this was edema, how much of this was rebleeding, how much of it was both um, clearly all bad stuff. Any other thoughts from the audience? Dr. Das. Zach, Zach, first I'll echo Annalise. Thanks for sharing this. I think, um, you know, you've presented this as a MIPS complication, but I think all of us could find a patient like this who we've done what we thought was a definitive procedure and, and, and seen things go otherwise. Um, if you were to look at the flare, I wonder, was he hemorrhaging into infiltrated brain? Probably, yeah. 
you know, I, I'd have to go back and pull it up, but certainly based on my recollection of, he, he had a tremendous amount of flare signal surrounding this, so. You know, I, I, I again, I think, I, I'd, um, I think we all have patients like this where you see a large solitary tumor like this, but a substantial amount of infiltrated brain. Yep. And to manage that, you'd end up frankly doing something akin to a hemispherectomy, right? So I think there are cases like this that MIPS or not, frankly, in a way, perhaps by taking a less injurious a, approach, you may frankly have been in a better place. You could have been presenting this to us as a success. You don't have to make me feel good about myself. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I presented it as a MIPS complication because I just wanted people to tuck in the back of their mind this idea that when there's a lot of edema, don't forget to start them on 3% or give mannitol at the end of the procedure rather than just hoping that the evacuation cavity is, is sufficient. Um, all right, Ron, we've got a case from you. And last quick question. Oh, yeah, please. That. So I agree with everyone else that I don't think of this as a MIPS complication, but do you think if you had done this case in a traditional craniotomy, you would have had that outcome? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, and I, I wonder, had I done it open, I would have given mannitol at the beginning of the procedure. In either case, we had, um, you know, large dose steroids. So I don't know. I don't know if the if mannitol would have been enough to avoid that syndrome. Probably not. Um, but again, I think there's an opportunity to learn from all these cases, MIPS or not. <clears throat> Run. All right, so something a little different here, though another tumor case. This is a 60-year-old woman with a history of breast cancer that's treated with bilateral mastectomy followed by chemotherapy. But then presented with a, some mild right-sided weakness and had this lesion. And here's our... DTI images, you can see the IFO actually runs just lateral to this. So I decided that I would do this with the MIPS approach, approach it from somewhat superior to the tract and from anterior, working anterior to posterior. Now, intraoperatively, that uh, view that Julian showed with the surgical theater, I swear this was my tumor that you were showing. <laughs> because it had all those vessels around it and adherent to it. And this was a case I did fairly early on. This was actually about eight years ago. And intraoperatively, you know, I can still see the vessel that was adherent to the tumor. And I had a great, I had great difficulty dissecting that off. Uh, this was in part a limitation of my instrumentation during the case, not having uh, grasping instruments to grasp the tumor, manipulate it. I didn't have scissors that I could use to work down the port. So I probably spent 30 minutes manipulating this vessel uh, before I was able to detach it from the tumor. And postoperatively, she had a right hemiparesis. So here we'll show our post-op images. This was done a bit delayed, so we can see some enhancement along the tract. But the key images here are uh, DWI images you know, showing the thalamic infarct. It was certainly the thelmo perforator that I'd spent a lot of time manipulating and probably had a bit of vasospasm postoperatively. So you know, this is another one that you might say, is this really a MIPS complication? But I felt it was because it was in part a limitation of my instrumentation during the case that I felt led to this. Um, so I'm curious if you were doing uh, MEPS or SSCPs during the case, did you have any neurophysiologic monitoring that might have clued you in that there was ischemia in that area? You know, I did not. And, you know, looking back, that may have been very helpful during the case and you know, at that point, I may have simply stopped and have been satisfied with an incomplete resection. Yeah. And then the, the other thing that I've done in cases where I've got a lot of vessel manipulation in order to dissect it off the tumor is then at the end of the procedure, either do gel soap, uh, gel foam soap for Apamil, uh or Apavarin, 
you know, in the cavity to try to prevent that vasospasm. Any other thoughts from the group? Uh, I do exactly what you just mentioned, and especially these deep lesions where you're looking at perforators going towards the internal capsule. Even if they look okay, there's mechanical irritation, and I will do papaverine on each one of those routinely yeah. because I've had that exact same complication. Even though I did not bipolar the vessel, I saw that it looked stenotic, small, and sure enough. You know, if you, if you go back to the original uh, scan and you think about what were the alternative corridors to get there, right? You're pretty much either looking at a subtemporal uh, or splitting the fissure and reaching back. In both cases, you're not only going to be manipulating that branch perforator, you're going to be manipulating the parent arteries significantly more. So I don't think there was much to avoid this. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. Justin or Julian, any thoughts? In general, I tend to use monitoring for people like all of those cases. Uh, and it doesn't always, um, uh, I, mean, I think Kai mentioned before, he'll stop resecting the test to something change. And that's been pretty reliable for any particular uh, for posterior approaches. Um, but I mean, this is all obviously the time. So. Um, and yeah, the, the being very careful with those vessels. I've certainly had instances where um, I didn't think I irritated or bothered the vessel, and then you see a small post op stroke. Uh, in this, you know, nothing is, uh, nothing, everything is sacred there, nothing is safe. So I do like the papaverin and uh, rapamil ideas that, you know, have not done that on the two, but I think that's a great, a great, uh, great idea. Uh, no, th this is a tough problem, man. You know, uh, uh, falsine tumors, even meningiomas, which are non-malignant, uh, can give you a very similar problem. You know, the, the vessels, uh, you're, you're wondering if it's you know, on passage or is it, uh, you know, supplying the tumor and you can almost convince yourself either way. Uh, and then you have a phenomenon of reaching the point of no return, right? Where you got to get it out and you have to bite the bullet sometimes. So these are tough problems. You just have to do the best you can, go to church every Sunday and things like that. <laughs> um, so you know, I consider this one maybe a more of a bread and butter case uh, in terms of an ICH and a great case to learn on and, and do. Probably one of my earlier um, ICH evacuations. Very, uh, I mean, it's pretty typical. Uh, I'd say Michigan uh, country guy, hypertension, diabetic, sleep apnea. I mean, uh, pretty obese. Um, uh, took him for an evacuation, um, and uh, we did a right frontal approach, um, kind of in recovery area. So he's extubated in recovery. He is hypertensive. He's coughing. He is breathing, but uh, and his exam is pretty good. But then he has a pretty um, you know, rapid lethargy, headache, reintubated. Um, and, um, we got a CT and this is a scan. So he has more IVH than he had before. And then the hemorrhage is actually bigger than it was before. Um, and then we took him immediately back. Um, we did identify a bleeder. Um, and then we were able to, um, so this is the, the second post-op scan, um, which, uh, does show still more blood in the ventricles. He has a little bit more ventricular megaly. Um, and, um, of course, uh, he had a rough, rough course after this. So, um, you know, challenges for me in this instance, you know, um, I think I mentioned before, you know, we definitely got into the ventricle in terms of the initial evacuation. Um, and I think a portion um, of my confidence in that things were dry was related to, I thought it was bloody CSF predominantly that I was encountering. Being very cautious with irrigation and uh, being really sure versus bloody CSF and you know, active bleeding, um, you know, in these instances. I'm not sure what I could have done to prevent him re-bleed, you know, being a little bit tricked by, um, I'd say, him bleeding more into the ventricle than not, because we, I think that's one of the challenges if you get into the ventricle that you just be really careful about and continue irrigating until you're certain. Yeah, no, I, I think we've all had this exact case. Um, my question for the panelists is, with a re-hemorrhage, would you choose a MIPS approach again, or would you choose a decompressive crany and, and leave, potentially leaving bone off? I always do a bigger decompressive craniectomy flap, but before I open the dura, I will recannulate and clean up because I know it's gonna be hard for me to clean that up without the port because this is deep. So as soon as I take the proximal two centimeters of clod, that brain's gonna close and the deep part, I'm not gonna be able to get to. So I'll, I'll do the flap, 
go through the same dural opening, go deep, re-evacuate and get hemostasis. And then once I'm happy with that, then I'll open the dura and do a expansive duraplasty and leave the bone out. Uh, no, that's a good approach. I, I, it's probably a you know game time decision depending on a lot of particular sites. Good to know both those approaches are available. I suppose sometimes you could do it just a repeat evacuation, but certainly got to ask yourself what went wrong the first time. What, what did you miss? Mm -hmm. Hate to say it, I haven't had a replay ICH, but but one question I have for everyone with doing these cases, there's always a point where you have most of the clot evacuated that comes out pretty easily. But then there's that adherent part down there where you know it's probably the initial hemorrhage. You dissect that off and control the vessel, or do you leave it? I think uh, if I inspect the cavity and feel pretty good about my evacuation and similar to um, evacuating, um, I mean, whether well, clipping an aneurysm and there's um, hemorrhage along the vessel, I would try and generally, uh, if I was otherwise satisfied, leave everything alone and probably um, accept it as good enough rather than cre create more injury. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay uh, leaving a little bit of, of adherent clot with the idea that it's tamponading or, or closing off the vessel. Um, as long as I feel like I've achieved a good decompression and I don't see active bleeding, right? And I think the one thing that you have to be careful is when you get down to that part, that's when you stop and you do a hypertensive challenge or a Valsalva and you sit and you watch that and make sure that there isn't something oozing out from behind that or oozing out from behind the SR you've left behind from the bipolar because that's what's going to come mm -hmm. back to haunt you. I would say I'll be a little more nuanced with that. So it depends on the etiology. So if I'm very convinced this was a hypertensive hemorrhage, they clearly came in, so really hypertensive, there was a, a visible spot sign, I will not close until I'm sure that I cauterize that spot. But if it's an amyloid hemorrhage, it's low bar, I'm not going to chase it. I'll evacuate whatever comes out easily, but I'm not going to try to get, you know, 90% 5% plus evacuation because that probably going to bring me back six hours later to clean out the area that I shouldn't have messed with. All right. On that note, let's do our, our last case for our last talk before happy hour. I don't know which one you picked. Oh, this one. Okay. So um, this first patient, um, 53 years old, this is a classic Grady patient, which is my county hospital, heavy crack cocaine use. And for that place, heavy means more than in most places. Also an alcoholic and a vasculopath. Uh, not a huge hemorrhage, 30 cc's, pretty symptomatic. And um, things go well, but this is where I started to learn that there are some things that you can fix and some things that you cannot. And I was so happy with this evacuation, but um, then this patient went into status epilepticus from withdrawal and then had sepsis and acute kidney injury and DVTs and had a pretty bad outcome for somebody who has no social support. So now I'm extremely picky and I just wanted to put this in there because you have to take those things into consideration that these people, no matter what you do, are going to have issues related to, um, to that. The second case was, was early on, uh, and uh, it's a 41-year-old patient uh, presenting with a larger hemorrhage, a 75cc hemorrhage. So as you can see uh, from that slice that, that I selected, it was a shorter distance coming posteriorly than it was laterally or anteriorly, it looked like a good trajectory for a posterior approach. So that's what I did. And you can see what happened. So this was early on before we had the 95 millimeter port. So I put in a 75 millimeter port. You see the image on the top left. So I got to where that dotted line is and, um, and I was maxed out. I could not uh, reach any farther and if you see on the uh, top right, as soon as I evacuated all of that hemorrhage, the brain just closed off and I could not see what was deep to me. So 
Uh, now we have the 95 millimeter port and that is not an issue, but length of the port in this clots is critical. If you undersize it, the brain will close up and you're gonna have distal hematoma. So that's something to, uh, to keep in mind when you're picking up your selection. I think we talked about not doing a cranial injury that is so small that you're gonna get hung up on the bone or the muscle flap if you're coming on a, on a lateral trajectory where you also have temporalis muscle in the way. And then this third patient is uh, a patient that uh, comes in with a hemorrhagic conversion of a stroke. This is another very early on and uh, lots of mass effect, nasty uh, hemorrhage. And, um, you know, we tried, but you can see the, the ischemic burden of this. And um, this is the uh, evacuation was okay, uh, but a few days later, yet another ischemic stroke from another side. Um, and since then, we don't do hemorrhagic conversions. They're tempting. Some of them look perfect. They're the right location. They're the right size. The ICU attending is calling. You're like, do it. Please do it. Don't do it. <laughs> um, so those are just three ICH cases that shaped what we do now. In, yeah. No, thanks. In so. I think the, the comment about not doing the hemorrhagic conversion is important because that is not a clot, right? That is petechial hemorrhage admixed with ischemic brain. And so you're, you're resecting brain in that case, and that's going to make them worse, make them re-bleed. Uh, we know from trauma studies, you re resect contused brain, you're going to make them coagulopathic, right? Probably not a, a good thing. Any questions or comments from the audience before we, we move on? Appreciate everybody's attention this afternoon. Appreciate the panelists' time and their honesty in sharing cases.